as I've seen the growing furor on the conservative side of the aisle, as we've seen a Donald Trump trade blows with Ron DeSantis, or even just attack Ron DeSantis, as it were, I began to think about a topic that I think all of us can draw some inspiration from. That topic is the idiom armchair quarterbacking or Monday morning quarterbacking. I make lots of analogies with my videos, and I think this one's going to be particularly cogent to the subject matter at hand, because as we've seen Donald Trump continue to say more and more things about Ron DeSantis and the state of the Republican Party, we have to be cognizant of what the true agenda may actually be. Now, armchair quarterbacking is an idiom that indicates an individual who sits back and watches a quarterback play football and then offers critiques or criticisms of that quarterback, knowing full well that they are not able themselves to do a better job. I've seen so many individuals rush to social media to share their thoughts on the divide that it appears to be growing between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. And what I want to say to you is that it's very easy to offer critique and offer criticisms in these times when you perceive any degree of failure whatsoever, because let's face it, we all do want to win. But I want to turn the clock back a couple decades for you first and set the stage for you. Back in 2001, we're talking about the New England Patriots. They had a quarterback named Drew Bledsoe. And Drew Bledsoe had had a couple of years that were not as profitable as the or successful as the Patriots would have liked. Uh, he had a couple of misfires here and there. And then he actually suffered a near fatal injury in 2001 that set up Tom Brady coming on as the, after being the backup quarterback. And then we all know how the Brady story ended. Another example is Jalen Hurts and Tua Tagovailoa in the 2017 National Championship game wherein Jalen Hurts was benched in favor of Tua Tagovailoa, and Tua went on to lead a comeback, and Bama won the national championship that year. Throughout that whole entire process, and even throughout the next full year, Jalen Hurts was a very gracious backup quarterback to the individual who replaced him, and they've gone on to enjoy varying degrees of success in the NFL. But I bring up those stories because as I've done my best to think about this status quo, about the Donald Trump versus Ron DeSantis phenomenon, I found myself trying to put myself in both individuals' shoes. I found myself wondering, why is it that Trump is saying what he's saying now? Why is it that so many individuals are now warming to the concept or the prospect of Ron DeSantis running in 2024? What I wanna encourage you to do as we see this continue happening is ask yourself the question, if you were the coach of a football team. And if your quarterback made a couple mistakes or maybe threw an interception or fumbled the ball, would you immediately pull that player out in favor of the backup? Or would you consider allowing that player to stay in the game for the sake of their own confidence and future productivity? And would you then allow that player to stay in the game and hopefully right those wrongs? And how would you feel if you were the player on that metaphorical gridiron yourself? and you had done your best to get your team in a position to win, and then something happened, or maybe there was a penalty that went uncalled, and then someone was clamoring for your backup to come in and replace you, and then that backup was inserted into the game, and you were allowed to sit on the bench for the rest of human history. How would you feel about that? As I've begun to think more and more about what Trump has gone through these past several years, and as I begin to compare and contrast that with what we've seen with Ron DeSantis coming out now, what has become very easy to see is that on the right side of the aisle, because of these past two years, we have become extremely ravenous for an easy win. We want an easy win. Easy wins are great and we need wins now more than ever. I 100% understand that. But the question is, are we fully ready to move on from the Donald Trump years? Donald Trump is the individual who has taken slings and arrows for years in his pursuit of the MAGA movement. And now we see many individuals on the right who are pointing to DeSantis's decisive victory in Florida as being an indicator of his future prowess as potentially the Republican nominee for president in 2024. And I completely understand that sentiment. We do like those easy wins. But what happens when you almost call things a little bit too soon? We know that there have been so many individuals on the right side of the aisle 
who, for one reason or another, have chosen to make it their mission to, quote unquote, move on from Trump. We've heard that sentiment said by many individuals who walk the halls of power to this day. We know that there's people like Lindsey Graham, there's people like Kevin McCarthy, people like Ronna McDaniel, who, for one reason or another, seem to want to distance themselves from Trump. In these last 48 hours, as of this video, we've seen even individuals like Winsome Sears and the conservative pundit community come out and say, now it's time to move on from Trump. It's very revealing, though, when you understand that individuals on our side, we are seizing on that demonstrable landslide in Florida on the part of Ron DeSantis. But you have to ask yourself where that came from to begin with. It is a fact that if it were not for Donald Trump helping Ron DeSantis rise to his current position, that Florida might look very different today. But when you also analyze the fact that there's many individuals on the right and on the left who now seem to be calling more and more for Trump to step aside, move on, to forget what happened in 2020, and then allow Ron DeSantis to rise to the fore, it makes you wonder why that is the case. I'd posit this to you. Anytime you hear the uniparty leaders saying something and seemingly being in agreement with individuals on the left, you need to start asking yourself a few more questions. Why is it that many in the uniparty, many of these rhinos want Trump to go, go and stay gone? Why is that? And it should make you wonder why there has been such a growing furor even in the face of a midterm election where we had over 200 wins and the handful of comparative losses that we had, albeit high profile losses and things that are still going on in the election, makes you wonder why is it that people are looking for a scapegoat? It's very easy to point at someone else to say they are the reason we don't have what we want. It's very easy to find a scapegoat. And I can't help but think that if I were in Trump's shoes myself, that I would feel as if people were trying to move on from me. Now, it bears mentioning that Trump has a massive, massive ego. This comes as a surprise to no one whatsoever. So, there are some things that we know about Trump that need to be fixed. Like I said in the beginning, quarterbacks can make mistakes. They can fumble the ball, throw interceptions, and so on and so forth. But as long as they are willing to take responsibility for those missteps, then there could possibly be a future for that person to stay in the game and continue playing. One of the biggest gripes many individuals on the right have had with Trump has been his reaction to the age of medical tyranny, as I like to call it. And there's been so many people who are saying that, oh, well, he, he pushed the jab. Yes, he did. And he continues to do so and has not put his ego in check long enough to realize how much of a disastrous mistake that actually was. And as long as that continues to be the case, as long as Trump doesn't put his ego aside and say, you know, I made a mistake on this and it's OK to make mistakes. As long as he doesn't take ownership of that, we're going to see people continue to look for other individuals to rise to power who they might deem as more electable. But also, it's important to understand that there's always going to be finger pointing on both sides, one side to the other. Oh, this person endorsed so-and-so. There's people who are looking into who Ron DeSantis has endorsed, people looking into who Trump has endorsed, who Trump has had around him. There's been so many mistakes that have been made, and one could argue, by both individuals. But why is it that right now, while we're still waiting for some very consequential races to be called, why is it that individuals on our side have chosen to almost cannibalize each other? I would argue it is because the left wants nothing more than to utilize this as a distraction and as the main talking point for many individuals on the right, even as we can't get clear answers as to why, for whatever reason, now two years after 2020, we still can't get votes counted on time. And we know that that was put into place because of them trying to oust Trump in the first place. So when you understand that that is at the basis of everything that the left wants to do to this country and our election system, why would you metaphorically, if I used a football term, why would you want to allow the other team that got away with a penalty to run up to the line of scrimmage, snap the ball, and not allow that last play to be reviewed? 
The only reason that we are seeing issues going on with the elections now in 2022 is because we never adequately addressed the issues in 2020. And the blame for that should be placed at the feet of individuals on the right, those rhinos who, for one reason or another, cannot seem to understand how important it is to make sure that we have election integrity in this country. As long as that is allowed to persist, it doesn't matter who you put up there to run if you don't want Trump to run anymore. You can say, oh, I want I want Marco Rubio to run for president. It doesn't matter. It's not going to fix what happened that got us in this mess in the first place. And I can't help but think that some of the frustrations we might be seeing being aired right now by Trump have to do with the fact that we still have people who have not taken that election integrity situation seriously. I also wonder why in conjunction with many rhinos who are now calling for Trump to step aside, why you have a hedge fund CEO and philanthropist, I believe his name is Ken Griffin or Ken Griffith, who has sunk tens of millions of dollars into Ron DeSantis. Why is that the case? Because Ken Griffin is actually the hedge fund CEO of a company called Citadel. And if you're familiar with some of the chicanery that went on, even with the GameStop issue a couple years ago, or the GameStop, if you want to call it that, a conflagration, you know that Citadel was involved in an effort to quash the voice and the will of the people. That's just one example. And I'm not saying that Trump is blameless here because Trump has surrounded himself time and time again with the worst kinds of people who have stabbed him in the back. But if there is still an opportunity for an individual to redeem themselves, I do believe that it is incumbent upon us to realize how dangerous it could be to play into the rhino's agenda. There's so many who do want to move on from Trump because there's plenty of people on the right who even in 2018, when we would think that we ostensibly had a chance to right many wrongs, even many members of the right chose to stab us in the back. The infamous John McCain thumbs down moment, many other moments come to mind. But those are the same kinds of people now who want desperately for us to say, OK, it's time to move on. All right. You know what? Leftist. All right. We know that what you did in 2020 in 2020, it's OK. We're going to let you just get away with it. We'll try someone else. And what good would that do? That would only allow their bravado to increase because they realize that instead of actually focusing on the main issues that got us in this mess in the first place, we're too busy trying to find the cleanest person to run for office, that bright, new, shiny object. This is all a distraction. And I hate the fact that there's so many even conservative pundits and they want to run around now and say, oh, I think this person should run. This person should run when they all know deep down. The only reason that their voices were amplified or gained any sort of relevance or notoriety in the first place is because they chose to ride on Trump's coattails. And now, because they rode on his coattails for so long, now they're the same influencers or pundits who will fly around the country in first class uh, signing books and selling you books, telling you things you already know. But they're nowhere to be found. We need to actually have boots on the ground in certain areas because there is no good reason after these last two years, why any leftist politician who advocated for any kind of lockdown, there's no reason for any of them to have win. That should have been an avalanche. But there's one person a few months back, by the name of Scott Pressler, who chose to say that he didn't think there was a red wave coming. And the reason why he thought there was no red wave coming was because he, in his own words, said that he didn't think there were enough individuals on the right who were out doing those things you have to do to win these consequential elections. There's been so much talk of, oh, I'm so angry. I'm so angry about 2020. Okay, well, then what did you do yourself personally? Because one thing that I do have to say is that there have been opportunities for these influencers, for these pundits, for these figures to actually go out in the community in order to help make sure that we don't see 90 plus percent of black men and women voting for Democrat candidates, like we've seen in 2022. It's almost as if we've seeded defeat and now we're just coalescing and crumbling inwards on top of ourselves. Because instead of doing the hard work, we want to look for the next bright, shiny object because we want to find the person who's going to own the libs and say all those things that are going to make us feel good and say, yeah, sticking it to the left. Yeah, that's great. But in the end, it's going to become an echo chamber if we do nothing 
to reach out and try to bring more people and just apply common sense to them and have them realize, look, these past two years, this politician did X, Y, Z. They shut your schools down. They shut your job down. But we didn't have enough people on our side who were delivering that message because many of them were too absorbed with their own self-perceived clout. And they would rather live those lives of opulence and post the pictures of them at Mar-a-Lago hanging out or flying first class or this or that or charging five, six figure speaking fees to come speak to you instead of actually doing the work that needs to be get done. We need a lot more Scott Presslers because I'm, let me tell you, these people out here can still be won. These extra voters that we need to have in order to truly shift that pendulum, they can be done. If we simply take the time to look inward instead of trying to point our fingers and find a scapegoat and someone else to conveniently cast blame on. Oh, we didn't win. It's this person's fault. It's this person's fault. You know what? It's your fault and it's my fault. And the reason I say that is because after these elections, I spent time thinking about myself first. I said, you know what? Harris County here in Houston, Texas, where I live, still went deeply blue. And my first thought was, who can I blame for this? My first thought was, I should have done more. Y'all know I work incredibly hard to deliver content, to write scripts and all that. But I still should have done more. And that same level of energy should be something that each and every one of you feels similarly. You should say, what else could I have done? Why are the midterm election numbers lower than general election numbers? Why? It's because people stayed home. Because they did not have that fire lit underneath them. To do more. And that's why I do my best to do things like organize a protest against a drag queen story hour in my backyard. These are the kinds of things we have to do. But on our side, we'd rather point fingers and say, oh, I'm on this side. I'm on that side. I'm on this side. I'm on that side. Because we put our faith in politicians alone, not in the Lord Jesus Christ, in our own efforts and what we can possibly do at the individual local level. Because even after these past two years, some of us are still asleep. Some of us were still saying, oh, I'm too tired on the weekends. You know, we're not showing up to the school board meetings anymore. We're not showing up to these local town halls anymore. Because to us, we'd more, we'd be more inclined to sit there and say, okay, I guess things are okay now. I can just survive just with this new status quo. Because we haven't found it within ourselves to take the steps we need to take to look into what happened in 2020 and to demand some sort of accountability for it. That's the message I wanted to leave you with. Instead of saying, oh, someone else should do this, what else can you do? How many doors did you knock on these midterms? How many people did you actively try to change their mind? Not on social media, but in person. These are the questions you should be asking yourselves. Many of you don't even know this, but when I released the shirts that I designed a few months ago, there were three words on those shirts. The first word, the first choice was think. The second was question. The third was verify. I haven't mentioned this, but at some point I'll release a fourth one, which says decide. And the reason I did that is because that should be the process. You should think about what you can do differently. You should question what you hear being pushed by the mainstream media and the rhinos and the pundits and the powers that be. You should verify if what you're hearing is actually the truth. And you should decide what you want to do moving forward. The right now is nothing more than armchair quarterbacking. Instead of armchair quarterbacking, it's time for you to actually put some more skin in the game. Do more. Because yes, we know Trump has an ego. That needs to be addressed. Trump made mistakes with the the jabs and with some of the lockdowns and so on and so forth. DeSantis is no saint either. And if we simply look for the next bright, shiny object, instead of being willing to do more work and demand accountability for what happened in 2020 in the first place, We're going to complete this cycle and continue this cycle forever. No one wants that. I know we want easy wins. I know we like easy wins and pointing to them. But sometimes wins take more work. And I want to encourage you out there and myself as well to do more work in the time between 2022 and 2024 so we can hopefully fix what has gone horribly wrong in this country. That's the message for this video. Let's pray. God, you tell us in Romans 8, verse 28, you say, all things work together for good to them that love you, 
to them who are called according to your purpose. And even now, in this tumultuous time we find ourselves in, I ask you to reach out and touch everyone watching this video or who will watch this video and give them a measure of peace. And I ask you to give them the wherewithal to look within themselves and to ask you to seek your face and ask you what more they can do to achieve better results in the future. Instead of pointing fingers, I ask you to give them that resolve as we press on beyond the midterms and onward into the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's the message for this video. I want you to think about it. And if you agree, I want you to share that with someone else. Because it does start with us. It starts with you and it starts with me. Taking those little tiny steps. Because those steps will add up in the long run. But you know how it is. It's Damani Felder. You can find me here on Facebook. Find me on YouTube at The Wright Brothers Channel. Find me on Instagram at The Damani Felder. Find me on Twitter at The Damani Felder. Find me on TikTok at The Damani Felder. Find me on Telegram at The Damani Felder. You can find me at Gab. I'm on Truth Social at The Damani Felder. Also go to my website, DamaniFelder.com, if you so choose, to find ways to get better involved, to help each other at the local level, and then get more involved. Stop armchair quarterbacking. Know that this whole furor will blow over. But it's just a distraction right now. It has been put there intentionally by the Uniparty, by the rhinos, and by the left. So they can sit back and chuckle as they watch us eat our own and fall by the wayside. And we cannot allow that to happen. Thank you so much for watching. I love you all. I appreciate you all. And I'll catch you in the next one.